Hello everyone, welcome back to the workshop. Um, quite a short video for you today. Uh, we are back on with the D7. Uh, we've made a little bit of progress, but uh, not a great deal. Um, I have just come back from holiday actually, um, been away with the family and um, spent some nice uh, relaxing time away from life, which is, is always good uh, to get away and have a break. Um, I am going to plug some of my friends and uh, a new channel. Well, not a new channel, but um, a new sticker. Uh, Shed Racing, and that's Ivan Dutton. Um, he's uh, big into classic sports cars and classic racing cars. And um, those of you that follow that scene will know Ivan. He's been around for, for many, many years. He's in his 80s now, and he still regularly goes on the track in a classic racing car and um, leathers it in the way that it was intended to be uh, leathered. So uh, Shed Racing, uh, well worth checking out. We've got a great workshop. Uh, he and his friend John uh, working on all these classic cars. Um, you'll definitely get something if you go over there and, uh, and watch them. Um, my other friends are all uh, busy at the moment in their workshops. Aid from AG Engineering. He's uh, cracking on with his um, 650 BSA powered aerial scrambler. He's got a rolling chassis together now, so that's well worth a look. Um, Will at Coleman Customs. Uh, he's cracking on with his um, 650 Thunderbird Triumph build. Um, and uh, if you read Britain's best selling classic motorcycle magazine, you've probably seen him gracing the pages because he's often in there. But uh, check out his channel, uh, well worth a look. Uh, we've got Ian uh, over in Norfolk at In The Shed. Um, Ian, a bit like me, buys uh, rusty old tat, but uh, you should see the finish on the bikes that, uh, that he builds. He builds some fantastic machines. Uh, he's doing an A50 at the moment, um, which was an absolute wreck, um, but that's going to be a proper bike when it's done, I'm sure of it. So yeah, he's worth uh, checking out as well. Um, we've got Michael over in America, um, British expat in upstate New York. Uh, Britannia Motorcycles, he is doing the British Trials Bikes, he's just completed a, a Royal Enfield and he's cracking on um, another bike at the moment, I think a BSA um, for himself. He's basically put together a trials team of, um, sort of local riders and it's all on bikes that he's built so it's well worth a, a look. Um, we've got Dale again in the States, uh, Dale Swager, he's doing your vintage Japanese Trials Bikes and he is the expert on anything to do with um, TS, DT, uh, TY, RM. You know, if, if those are the, um, the bikes that you like, uh, there's definitely something over there at uh, Dale's channel for you. In fact, um, check them all out because, you know, we're all motorcycle people and um, you know, we can learn something from each other. Um, and then last but not least, my brother Carl. Um, he's not doing motorcycles, but he is doing really high quality engineering. Um, cracking on with his Harrison Mill refurb and he's recently undertaken a new project. He's going to build a gas turbine engine. Um, why wouldn't you? You know, why wouldn't you build a gas turbine engine in your shed? Uh, and that's exactly what he's doing. Uh, so go over there and, and check out Carl. And um, I'll put links in the intro to this video. Right, um, enough of me. Let's get on and uh, look at the banter. Right, a little bit more progress. Um, we've got the brake connected up now, and we've got our spring and check nut fitted. Um, I did run the quarter British Standard Cycle uh, die down the thread, cleaned it up nicely. So we have that connected up now. We'll just go to the front end. So at the other end of the brake rod, um, we fitted the brake switch now. Here it is. You can see that as it as the brake rod moves, it pulls on the spring. There's a little clamp here pulls on the spring and uh, operates the switch. Probably can't see that very well for the uh, the loop of wire that's coming out there. Uh, as with um, a lot of these older British bikes, the um, stoplight switch was an optional extra. And when you hear optional extra, uh, it generally means afterthought. And um, you can see that it literally is very much an afterthought, really. It's not integrated into the, the design of the bike at all. Um, but it's an installation that works. It does put the stoplight on, but um, yeah, I'm not keen on it. I have to, I have to say, um, I'm particularly not keen on the quality of this aftermarket um, switch. Um, obviously, it's a replica. You can't get the original Wipac ones anymore. This one's a replica, and it's just it has a really truly awful feel to it. Um, but you know, it works. It puts the light on, so we got to we got to kind of 
live with it. But um, yeah, it's probably my least favorite part of the bike so far. Um, but anyway, let me move the camera and I, I will show you the, uh, the stop switch operating the, the, the brake light in all its glory. Before we do that, there you go. The brake works. So let's um, let's have a look at the uh, the brake light. Right, let's give it a burst. There we go. First time it's done that. Fitted to the bike in quite some time, I would imagine. So that's the first circuit done, and we've just got the rest to do. Um, that's working on six volts, and we will have to fit a 12 volt bulb um, when we get everything connected up. But um, it's good enough just to prove the system. So here's something else I've done. Uh, I fitted one of these uh, magic LED headlight bulbs. I don't know if you can see it in there, you might just be able to make it out. So that's a pretty good view of it. Um, and I've got the old uh, trusty Enduro battery charger running on 12 volts. So let's just connect it up. I'll show you how bright it is. I won't shine it directly in your eyes. That would be rude. Oh, well, look, it's uh, we're having uh, special effects with the camera. But anyway, you can see how bright that is. Uh, but look at the current draw. And I'm sure most of you know this already. You're probably using these bulbs and have done for years. Let me get it into focus. Bit of parallax. It's under half an amp. Um, quarter of an amp maybe. A little bit more. So that's um, interesting. Now I think you're supposed to use... Let me just turn it off. I think you're supposed to use a battery with these uh, with these lamps. I think for batteryless systems, uh, people have issues. Uh, they need a stable um, source of power, but that isn't an issue because we're going to use a battery with this bike anyway. But uh, if we're only drawing a quarter of an amp on the headlight, um, that's very good. Uh, it means that we're we're not going to have you know highly loaded circuits, big drains. So interesting. Very interesting. Right, let's get on with something else. Right, so having a bit of a sneak peek inside the battery compartment. Um, you're not going blind. There's no battery fitted at the moment. But as you can see, I've been doing some wiring. Um, it's a bit of a snake's wedding at the moment, um, but it will tidy up nicely once we've uh, once we've got the wiring harness installed, um, which we're yet to make. Um, we've got our cable here from the rear light, and um, there's our earth connection going into a four-way connector. Um, which will connect the battery um, negative connection and also it'll provide a, a negative connection for the wiring harness. Uh, then we've got a fly lead coming down to the frame. Um, I did mention that I'm not going to rely on frame earths for the services, but um, I want everything to be bonded um, so that we, um, we have the same potential all over the bike uh, and that way we don't get any problems with, um, with corrosion. Uh, that's where corrosion generally tends to come from when you've got differing potentials um, you know you get uh, you get the horrible creeping green nastiness um, so we'll try to avoid that if we can um, we've also got our side light connection here the black cable uh, which will connect into the wiring harness we've got our brown which is a stop light going down to the switch and then we've got our um, cable coming back from the switch uh, which is um, seeking a feed and that will be connected into the horn side of the wiring harness. Uh, that's where that will pick its feed up from. Um, over here, we've got the charging cable coming back from the regulator rectifier. That's bonded to the frame here. So that will charge the battery via this fly lead into the four-way connector. And then we've got our positive here uh, from the regulator rectifier uh, and that will go into another four-way connector um, which will serve the positive side of the battery and the positive side of the wiring harness. And then just here you can see the, um, the cable coming from the CDI unit and the stator, uh, which is disappearing under the tank, going to the ignition coil, regulator rectifier, and uh, the ignition wiring that's hidden under the tank. Um, so the battery will fit here. Um, I'm going to put a nice um, rubber pad in here just to... Um, isolate it slightly this is the original bsa bantam battery tray um, i'll be putting a 12 volt 
glass mat battery in there. I can't remember the exact make and model. Um, it's the uh, the yellow, whatever the yellow brand is. I'm sure many of you use those batteries, uh, but I've got one of those on order. So um, no leaky mess like the old style batteries. Um, these modern ones are, uh, well, they've been fully sealed for years, haven't they? But um, I understand the glass mat technology ones are particularly good and uh, vibration resistant as well. So we should be onto a winner there. Um, so we'll have a look at the uh, the wiring diagram in a moment and uh, figure out what we need to uh, what we need to do in terms of wiring this bike up for the services that we're going to use, and I will be basing it um, roughly on the original BSA uh, wiring diagram. But obviously, we're using uh, the Bowen CDI system, so we don't need to worry about the ignition side of things. That's uh, that's self-contained. We just need to worry about um, lighting and uh, and the horn so we'll have a look at that in a moment well we're over at the bench and I thought we'd have a look at some of the materials and tooling that I use to repair wiring and to make new wiring harnesses and these things we've seen before these are our standard um, British bullet connectors found on many British vehicles, motorbikes, cars, trucks, plant machinery from, I don't know, probably since Noah was a lad, uh, right up until I would say the 1980s. Um, many, many British vehicles uh, use these things. Uh, you can crimp them on, you can solder them, or if you're particularly pedantic like me, you can do both. Uh, a lot of people frown at that practice, but um, I've never had a problem with it. Um, you get a good mechanical um, join and you get a good um, electrical connection as well that way. So that's my preferred uh, method of fitting these. Um, let me show you the tooling that I used to crimp them on with. Uh, I used to have the dedicated pliers, which are kind of like a little keyhole crimp, and they did a really good job. But unfortunately, um, a lot of my tools got stolen many years ago and uh, they went and uh, I've not replaced them yet. But I do have these. Um, which I've had since I was 16 when I was a um, fresh faced apprentice and I'm 50 now so there you go they've done well haven't they um, still giving sterling service and um, these are the blue point snap on um, combined wire strippers and crimping pliers and uh, when I was uh, learning many many years ago these were called amp pliers and the reason why they were called amp pliers it's not because they're electrical, it's because um, there was a popular British brand called Ampliversal and they made um, a lot of uh, auto electrical tools. And um, in the works that I was at, uh, when I bought these, they were known as uh, my fancy snap-on amp pliers. So there you go. Um, it doesn't matter what brand you buy, they're always amp pliers. But anyway, digressing ever so slightly there. Um, that's the part I used right there. Um, let me just get my thumb up to the right place. Uh, the non-insulated um, area. So I use that part there, crimp it onto the wire, and then um, solder it up. So there you go. Fancy snap-on amp pliers, 30-something years old and still going strong. Um, here are the receptacles. Um, again, you've seen these on the bike, and most of you probably know what these are, uh, although it might be news to somebody. You never know. Um, you've got the um, the four gang, common connected. Uh, you've got the singleton, as I like to call it. Uh, but you get um, three connections, uh, five connections, various different uh, connotations of the same thing, really. These are the most popular ones. These are the ones I use most of all, the singles and the fours. Um, the much... Um, they're much less pliable than they used to be. Um, these things used to be quite soft rubber. And it was better, well, it was better and worse. They used to perish, so they needed replacing. But they were easier to fit because I have here um, the correct tool for putting them together. And uh, again, when I was apprentice, these had a special name. They were called pusher inners because... You put the uh, the crimped cable on each end and you use it to push her in. And um, as I say, these receptacles used to be a lot softer. 
and um, when you squeeze the, the pliers together it you know it squashed the rubber down made sure that the wire went right in now they kind of deform a little bit you kind of have to work them back to shape afterwards but they still work uh, and it's pretty much all you can get these days so you kind of have to live with it so there we go um, we've got our snap-on amp pliers and we've got our ripolts pusher inners um, ripolts another um, old british auto electrical company that's um, unfortunately uh, gone the way of many great british companies out of business so there we go um, these you'll all recognize uh, just ordinary ring terminals and these are the type that you fit with the um, ratchet crimp this type of thing um, there is different uh, sizes on the end um, you ratchet it down and it gives you a nice connection um, on your ring terminal or indeed on your uh, Lucar type spade terminal and these boxes of terminals are super cheap you can get them on um, a lot of your online sites, um, auto electrical places, various different locations. They're not terribly expensive and they're handy to have around. So there you go. Some of the tooling and some of the connectors. Well, we're looking at a kind of wiring diagram. Um, and you're thinking, that's not a wiring diagram. Nothing's connected up to anything. And uh, you're right, that's, that's how I do it. Um, I know that there's going to be a wiring harness interconnecting everything in between, so I don't bother to draw it on. I just kind of do it as an aid memoir, and um, I draw the bits where the wires are going to go to, and I need to know what colours are going where, and you know what connections are going to, to what terminals. So that's how I do it. Um, you know, a lot of it is kind of in my head, but um, this is a bit of an aid memoir for me. Um, Anybody that's interested um, in wiring up the YPAC 781 type switches, you can use them for lighting or you can use them for ignition. Um, this is the configuration for lighting. Um, if you're not following uh, the BSA wiring diagram to the letter and you just want to use it um, for your own application, um, this, is, uh, this might help you. Um, if you look over here we've got eight and nine strapped and that takes the feed from the wiring harness so this is your uh, your positive coming in we've got seven four and three strapped and then that's feeding out to the speedo and the tail light number five is feeding the dip switch and number two is feeding the pilot light and if you wire it in that configuration, you will get um, headlight and tail light uh, and speedometer light when you're in the high position. And you will get um, pilot light and tail light when you're in the low position. And then obviously you've got your um, number five terminal going out to the dip switch. And that goes to the center connection on the dip switch which will feed either your main beam or your uh, dipped beam so they're quite a confusing little number those YPAC 781 switches I've got one here um, it's a dud but I've got one this is what they look like on the back um, basically if you put it like that with the gap there oh, it's not very well focused is it but if you, put, if you see where my thumb is, that's the gap. That's pin one working round clockwise. So there you go. That's, your, that's a better view there, look. It's kind of like a little, almost like there should be a terminal there, but there isn't. Um, put that here at the sort of three o'clock position, and then that there is terminal one. Anybody wants that um, emailing to them, let me know. And... Uh, I shall scan this and uh, email it out to you. I've also got a configuration for doing um, a basic ignition switch where you just get a feed in and a feed out, uh, basically on and off. Um, so let me know. And uh, if you want it jotting down and sending to you, I will be more than happy to do it.
Here's the, uh, the standard Y patch socket. This one's a bit of a dud as well. I'm going to replace it. Um, but um, when when you strap these uh, connectors together, like eight and nine, seven, four and three, you can just solder little link wires onto here, onto the back of the plug. Makes it so much easier. So there we go. Um, that's how we're going to wire the thing up. And um, you see here, I mentioned earlier, um, a good earth bonding point. Very, very important. Even though I run uh, separate um, earth leads, like my rear light here. Oh, you can't see it. Let me move it. One second. I'm waffling a bit, but I think it's important to get this across. It might help somebody. Um, I've got a negative, uh, an earth lead coming off my rear lamp. Uh, going into uh, my connectors that are in, sorry, down here, my connectors that are in the uh, the uh, battery compartment. I've got an earth lead coming off my headlamp. Basically, I've got an earth lead running all the way through the wiring harness, feeding anything that um, that needs an earth. But you can't always have that. For example, your horn push needs an earth. So it's important that you don't have these differing potentials uh, what can be caused by bad earths um, because not only will you get low performance on your services, uh, you know, a weak horn or dim bulbs, for example, if your light unit is earth return, um, you'll also get that horrible creepy green corrosion growing on everything um, and you'll get you'll get problems so many wiring problems so many electrical problems uh, caused by faulty earths um, and differing potential between components so yeah top tip bond it well and if you can run earth leads run earth leads because you'll get brighter bulbs you'll get a better sounding horn and you'll get less problems down the road uh, than if you rely on um, earth returns for everything that's just my opinion. Um, you know, I've been doing that for a, a good number of years and uh, not had a problem with it. Um, the next thing I'll mention, I, I know I'm going on a bit, but um, I think it, it, again, it's worth mentioning. When you make a wiring harness, if you're gonna make your own harness, um, build it as a component, as a, a replaceable component. Don't sort of build it into the bike. Um, I've worked on quite a few bikes where people have wired them up and you've got wires running sort of through holes and they've got plugs on the end and you can't get them out and they become part of the framework of the bike um, as much as you possibly can make the wiring harness a component that can be unshipped from the bike put on the bench and you know um, con checked to make sure there's no faults so if you do get faults down the line you can remove portions of your wiring loom um, get it on the bench and, and properly con check everything and, and get to the, the root of the fault. And on that note, um, plan where your brakes are going to be. Um, for example, I've got the rear light wiring is, it, it breaks in the battery compartment. So I can remove the back end of the bike, take the wiring with it without you know, dragging the whole wiring loom with it. Um, the, the main sort of center and mid section of the wiring harness will run from the battery compartment to the headlamp and then we'll have most of the connectors in the headlamp. So that section can come off the bike in one, one sort of lump uh, and be checked on the, ban on the bench. So that's, uh, that's another sort of tip that, that might or will help you out if, uh, if you uh, decide to make your own wiring loom. And um, having one of these things, and this is just a super cheap one, um, that you know if you drop it on the floor, and you break it, it's not really cost you anything, but it's got the con check. Uh, it's got obviously volts, ohms, amps, all the rest of it. It's even got a transistor checker on it. Um, super cheap, handy to have around. I've got a number of them. Um, I dropped one a little while ago, broke it, which is why I bought this one. Um, I have got a, an Avo multi-miner, really old multimeter. Um, but, uh, you know, 
I don't bring it out because it's Bakelite and I'm always worried that I'll drop it and, uh, and break it. But um, yeah, hopefully that's, that's um, a couple of tips for, for wiring on, certainly on the older bikes, but you know, modern stuff, um, Japanese stuff as well, uh, you know, top tips that might help you out. Well, there we go, my friends, uh, another video done and um, hopefully one uh, that you get some use from. Um, as ever, thanks very much indeed for watching. It's hugely appreciated. Um, all my subscribers, um, thank you very much. Uh, those of you that have been with me for a while, thanks for sticking around. And those of you that have come along more recently, uh, welcome. And I hope that you're enjoying the things that we do. Uh, there's certainly more to come. Um, if you haven't yet subscribed, uh, please do consider hitting the button. It won't cost you a shilling. Um, ring the little bell and uh, by the magic of internet, Retro Mechanica will be beamed directly to your pocket or wherever you keep your device that you watch your videos on. So uh, yeah, please do consider uh, helping the channel out. Uh, until next time, uh, take care of yourselves and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.